الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد. Right, check out this one, right? And maybe you guys might be able to relate to this a little bit more. When you're about to go on a holiday, do you or don't you make prep in advance? We all do. I was actually, not I was, I work alongside, uh, I have some colleagues, and one of my colleagues, she was drinking these sachet mixed drinks. So she said that, oh, it's because I'm going on a holiday, I need to look good. So I thought to myself, subhanAllah, I asked when's the holiday? She mentioned, I think it was like five weeks time or six weeks time. So she had already planned that I need to be looking good in these clothes in six weeks time. So I need to slowly, 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 slowly get to my ideal look. You get me? As a Muslim, we're supposed to anticipate Ramadan. And actually mentions, there was one in regards to some salaf, it mentions that it was the actual the amal of some salaf of the past, some of the pious predecessors. They would actually make dua six months in advance. Forget like 60 days, 20 days, 40 days, or like the other girl, six weeks. Six months in advance. So if we were thinking like, for example, now July, January, February, March, April, May, June. So from the start of Jan, every day I'm making dua, ya Allah, please just let me live long enough to reach Ramadan. Because these men had the value, you get me? They really appreciate what Ramadan was all about. I'm gonna be real with you, SubhanAllah, for a lot of us, Wallahi, if we, be, if we be honest and judge and jury for ourselves and not fear that no one's gonna judge us, a lot of us will say we find Ramadan really challenging. It's tough, you get me? And I'm gonna be real with you, a lot of us find it tough. What we go, if you ask people, what do you like about Ramadan? It's, it's the family thing, isn't it? It's the spirituality, it's the family, it's the iftars, it's that kind of community-based spirit. And that is one thing, subhanAllah, which is not really the ultimate goal of Ramadan. The ultimate goal of Ramadan is for us to individually build up connection with Allah and to build up the quality of taqwa. I mean, that is one of the main reasons. And we can look for, look for secondary, tertiary or other examples to say, it's because of this reason or this reason or this reason, but the, Allah only gives one example, and that is, I made, uh, fasting has been made per, incumbent upon you. Ya amanu, kutiba alaykum as kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum, la'allakum tattakhun. There's only one reason why Allah wa ta'ala has made fasting mandatory on you, man, and us, right? And everyone in the ummah as a whole, it was prescribed on you as it was prescribed on the people before for one purpose, and that is we build the quality of taqwa. Now taqwa obviously people generally translate this in different ways and you've heard me say this a couple of times and I'm hoping now you'd remember what taqwa is. But if you need a little gentle reminder, it's simply to do things that you're supposed to do and abstain from the things you're not supposed to do. And the ulama mentioned two particular qualities. Imtithal al-awamir. Fulfilling all the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say, if Allah says do something, you do it. And as a believer, we should actually seek out what is my Allah actually demanding of me in this circumstance, in this scenario. And if Allah doesn't want me to do something, what are those things I need to abstain from? And in essence, that is basically what we refer to as taqwa. So that is the purpose and maqsad of Ramadan for us to build up this quality and that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason why I say this, excuse me, because you know, I was having this chat with one Pakistani guy, right? And, if he's, and he was saying this thing, and he was like saying, Bro, I don't get Islam, yeah? Allah, all he says, but, but dari jolo bas. But dari jolo. Just be scared all the time. I'm like, bro, where the heck does it say that? Uh, you just live your life in this perpetual state of fear. He goes, Allah talks about taqwa. Taqwa, taqwa, taqwa. I'm like, what the heck do you mean? Were you supposed to just sit there, just freak out and just shiver? You get me? And quiver like some little leaf, bruv. Well, that's not deen. SubhanAllah, Allah saying, stay away from the haram things. And in that, it's your benefit. When Allah said, don't do something, it's because it's your benefit. When, okay, let's think about it. What did Allah say, don't do? Don't drink. Do you know how much crime is created because of drinking? Okay, Allah says, don't do zina. Bro, you know what the end result is of that? You got youths running around with don't even know who their parents are. You know, you got that, that breaking up of the fab fabric of society, the family unit. So there's all these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't gamble because one person will stand to gain at the cost of another. It doesn't create brotherhood, it creates musabaqa and competition where I'm looking to do over the next man. I want him to lose. And someone asked me, is life insurance allowed? I said, no, it ain't. And one of the reasons why, imagine one of your parents, Ali Adu Billah, but this is the reality, bro. If you got insurance and you're thinking, right, if my dad dies before he's 55, I'm gonna get paid a quarter of a million, but if he dies at 65, I'm gonna get 100 grand. Sad it is, a lot of people would say, I want man to just pull the plug and do one because I want a quarter of a million quid. So it creates that sort of 
selfish mentality. Whereas Islam promotes that as the parents get more and more older, it should be like, subhanAllah, this is going to be a means to me earning ajr. Wallahi, this is a means for me to earning the pleasure of Allah, the rahmah of Allah. I can serve my parents. Balkay mentions in the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu he made a baddu'a, a prayer against a type of group of people that may that person be disgraced. Listen to these words carefully, right? Jibreel makes the dua, alayhi salam. The angel Gabriel makes the dua. The Prophet hears the dua and says, Amin on the dua. May that person be disgraced who finds his or her parents in old age, one of them or both of them, but does not and, and, and fails to serve them and earning the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you guys following? That person, may that person be disgraced who finds his parents in that old age, fails to serve them and fails to get the rahmah of Allah. May that person be disgraced. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being rahmatul alameen, heard the dua and said, Amin. Makes sense. Because if this person can't be forgiven by parents in old age, then you are a goner. You get me? Similar Ramadan as well. May that person be disgraced who finds the month of Ramadan and fasting in Ramadan, all these things, but despite that does not get forgiven by Allah, may that person be disgraced. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Amin to that dua because it doesn't make sense. Bro, if you, I, I, how can it be? You find Ramadan and you're not forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. You really got to do some mad stuff not to get forgiven by Allah in Ramadan. Because Ramadan is a month that Rahmah comes down in bucket loads. And that's precisely why I said that some of the pious predecessors of the past, they always used to make this dua. Oh Allah, six months in advance, please just let me reach Ramadan. One more. Let me just read, reach Ramadan. Six months in advance. Oh Allah, please, Ramadan, please, Ya Allah, give me Ramadan. So for us, subhanAllah, our Ramadan is of a different nature. May Allah forgive us. We don't look forward to it in a similar sort of way. Balki Allah forgive. Wallah, I heard this in my own ears. This was in front of me. This happened, this waqiyah. So someone came and said, Ji, Mubarak ho ji. Kal se roze honge. Mubarak, mashallah, from tomorrow's fasting. One person said, he goes, Oh, Pai ji said, Kiri Mubarak, I thought, Pukhinal marna tri ti aare. This is what he said, right? Na'udhu billah. May Allah forgive me, I'm translating for you guys, right? He goes, bro, what's the Mubarak in that? I've got a staff for the next 30 days. La ilaha illallah, bro, say your kalima. That is some stupid comment you just made. Because you're equating Ramadan with just starvation. What about building that connection with Allah? Okay, maybe the guy said it as a joke. All right, fair enough. If it's a joke, it's not a, you shouldn't be making jokes like that. And if you were being serious, I worry about the person's iman that would make such a statement like that. Point is, are you guys following what I'm saying? So we're looking at Ramadan as a boj, as a pressure, as a burden, aliyadu billah. Whereas obviously the, the salaf of the past, they looked at it as a rahmah, as a mercy. Yeah, this is my opportunity, bro. this is my season. What happens, on, what happens on Christmas day? People bust a 20 hour shift. They would drive until literally they have to keep their eyes open with matchsticks because they know time and a half. Oh, Mawlidji, double bubble, bro, double time. So you even have people that fake taxi drivers. Just say, bro, yeah, where are you going? Yeah, I jump in, mate, let's go, yeah, 10 pound. Fake taxi drivers, they know the money to be earned. They loiter around the, the places where they're not supposed to be, blagging jobs, New Year's Eve, near the clubs, na'udhu billah. So the point is, seasons people look forward to. What happens in Hajj? Trust me, the shops go wild. Do you have people that come from afar to spend time literally in their shops? They take their sleeping bags there and they sleep. Take whatever sleep you need, get back on the job. 24 hours, some shops are open because non-stop around the clock, it's literally an ocean of people from all directions. Why miss out on the opportunity? Why miss out on the season? So similarly, there is a season for Ramadan. There is a season for us to also do good deeds. Now, obviously we live in the West, you get me? It's like, no, you can't be going and just taking off a month off work. It's not really practical. I'm gonna be real with you. Some of us may get four weeks paid leave. Some of us might get more. It's not so practical. And mashallah, if you have that privilege, then I really envy your position in that job. And if you are self-employed, maybe you can alter your work in such a way that maybe you can just fit a few hours here and there, but I'll leave you to be judge and jury for yourself how to fit that. My purpose is to look at from this angle that which mindset do we go into Ramadan with? And we really need to program ourselves to think of it in a different way because we've had loads of Ramadans in our life, you get me? Many, many Ramadan come and go in our life, but it doesn't really make much of a change. At the end, subhanAllah, it only takes a couple of days for us to go back to our normal practices before. So all Ramadan was, all we simply did, it was just a moving around of a timetable of our food. Realistically. Because, like for example, one brother I know, 
may Allah guide him, us and all, inshallah. He would go sleep after Isha, wake up for Fajr Salah, but not for the Salah, for the food. And he would literally belt two or three paratas, makan, drink them, and he'd be so full, oh, 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 seven up, oh, like, he's, brother, he's bursting at the seams, you get me? And now he's, oh, seven up, seven up, right? even said, now reduce the stomach pressure. My man going to sleep literally at 15 minutes for Fajr, bro, ittaqillah, make wudu and pray salah. But wait for 15 moments, he's so full, oh, I'm just gonna lay down. And then kharate until 12, three o'clock in the afternoon, even miss dohr. So what fasting is that? Are we literally just a tick box to say, right, staying hungry is fasting. That's not the maqsad of only the only, that is not the only sole purpose of Ramadan. There's other fara'id, other responsibilities. You only have to fast once a month. I mean, one month of the year. But fast, I beg your pardon, salah is a multiple ish for the day. You have to do that five times a day. Now look, I get it, look. And I'm gonna say this to everybody. Recently, my missus now, she was in Pakistan, right? And uh, she told me, she said it was time for Maghrib. So I said to my, I said to the guy at the shop, I said, brother, would you mind if I borrow Musalla? I want to pray. Now obviously, mashallah, you know I me, mean? alhamdulillah, Muslim country, Muslim living country, let's just say that. Not many laws, unfortunately, wallahi. Let me get started there. So she took the Musalla, laid it out, prayed the Salah. But because obviously it was quite busy, she just prayed three fard, gave the Musalla, Jazakumullah, brother carried on what she needed to do and left. But the family members that were with her, they criticized her. And I'm sharing this with you so we can take an ibrah to think, bro, we've taken culture to another thing. They criticized that you, ikiri namaz, bro, what sort of namaz is this? What sort of salah? Na sunta, na nafal, na, na tasi, na, na dua. She said, I know, I don't really do it, but we're in the bazaar. Look at the muqa mahal, look at the munasabah, look at the situation I'm in. There's the, su the surti hal, the, the predicament. Fard is in my head, let me take off the fard, alhamdulillah, I've done what I need to do, I can pray sunnah when I go home. And then they started saying, nah, this is just some, what, what Islam is this? So she said, you know what shaitan's doing to you? He's making you feel content by you not praying, by finding a straw man excuse. Do you get it? Criticize something small, just so you feel content and energy, I'm all right. But because of now something so minor, I'm gonna fin fi find a fault and feel content. No, no. You rationally use your brain. What is the minimum requirement for you to do? Fard at the bare minimum. This is why I say to the brothers at work and in the sisters as well. Look, I went to work. I, I go work as well. Yeah, okay, yesterday, alhamdulillah, I had some work, happened to work from home. Wednesday, same. Bro, come for time for salah. That's it. I mean, subhanAllah, I don't, I, don't, I don't mess around. Time for salah, I pray. You get me? Obviously, I don't stand in the middle of my office and Allahu Akbar, like some mad stretching legs out and making a big scene of myself. I'm blocking the road. No, I go to an office and I said, and I, I use it at the, uh, one, two, two, I know my office is shut. Meaning outsiders aren't allowed in. So I said, okay, I'll go into an office, Aram say, put my thing down, do my salah, alhamdulillah. That room's not gonna be used, you get it? And if I worry in advance that, oh no, we've got like a meeting, multiple meetings going on, I'd let them know, would you mind if I use the room for five minutes? The worst they're gonna say is, not just yet, could you use it in half an hour, an hour? And there's been that time where it was so busy and I had to see a client from two till three. All I did was finish at five minutes early. They wanted to go and I thought, good, good opportunity. He left, four fard. Now, are you gonna call me gunagar and sinful? No, no, astaghfirullah, Mawlvidi, you didn't pay sunnats. Well, I prayed the fard, right? I mean, obviously, if you can pray more, masha'Allah, tabarakallah. But look at the situation you're in. So what shaitan will make you do is use these, he makes people think, until I, until I don't pray sunnah, fard, nawafil, adhkar, ad'iyah, du'as, all these particular things, then it's no point in fasting. So don't ever think I'm criticizing that person. Understand why I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying this. Don't think to yourself, oh, because I do that, where I literally go sleep from fajr and all the way till dhuhr, that's not a fast. Bro, is that, that's what you do, continue to do that inshallah, it's fine. But make sure you do pray, you get it? However, the better way to do it is like this, you live a normal life in Ramadan. Listen to this word carefully, and I'm especially talking to these youths now, yeah, from the brothers. Go and spend your life like you normally would do. Look, Allah knew, yeah, what you could tolerate and what you can't, you know what I'm saying? Allah knew what you could bear. Astaghfirullah. Allah, it wasn't like astaghfirullah al that Allah wasn't, he didn't have this knowledge or was unaware. He's alim and hakim, his knowledge is eternal. He knew Muslims would inhabit lands like this, the predicaments we would be in, the circumstances, the situations. And he made fasting incumbent upon us. It wasn't that, you know, just fast until dhuhr. 
uh, fast just on your days off. Or for example now, just sleep all day and just open your fast just an hour before wake up. Listen, live your normal life. Allah knows what you can bear. And by chance, if you do have to go through that example and you physically can't bear it and the fast is becoming such that it's becoming taxing and you feel that you're going to get ill or your siha and health is going to drop, then in that instance, you're allowed to break the fast. Did you guys hear what I just said? Like one person, you can't just break the fast because you need, uh, I don't feel up for it today. That's not an excuse. If you feel your health is deteriorating your, or your health is already bad and it's getting worse at that point, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَى أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةُ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ If you're ill, you're unwell, or you're traveling, then you can simply fast and make it up on another day. Fasting is not an endurance test, but it is there to test you, your resolve and your will for the sake of Allah. Bro, if you can't even give up two roti for the sake of Allah, you get me? And control your eating and drinking. It's easy to make big, big stories. Oh, I'm going to do this for the deen, I'm going to do that. Like this one brother, subhanAllah. Local brothers approached this guy and said, Akhi, what are you saying? We should start in getting involved in da'wah. On a local level, he goes, listen, bro, see me, yeah? I'm going to go Africa, bro, six months. I'm looking big now. You're talking low, scale, low level. I've got big, big plans. I'm thinking of going seven months abroad. Badal. <laughs> like walking, bro. I'm going to go, literally. Uh, Yad, what are you talking about? You don't even, you don't even go for like th weekend. You don't even go for a little dawah store. You don't even spend a weekend away. What, what seven months are you going to do? So you see shaitan makes you think of these big, big plans. Bro, I'm aiming for that. I'm waiting for 20 years. I still haven't seen the geezer go. It's just shaitan makes you feel content. Make big, big plans. You're never going to get there. But just make a person keep on thinking. Start small and build yourself up, mashallah. Do you understand? Coming back on my point, I'm talking about Ramadan, right, guys? My honest appeal is this. One of the objections that some people, call it an objection, call it inquisitive, call it a misunderstanding. They ask us, they say, fasting doesn't seem logical to us. You get me? Like, you man are fasting, it doesn't make sense. Why would you starve yourself or deprive yourself from food? So the answer is like this, that firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what was best. He told us what to do. And spiritually, for us, it's a boost and we get closer to Allah by means of this, number one. However, keep this in mind. If we're falling into the same thing that I go to school and act all snowflakey, oh miss, I can't do PE because I'm fasting. I can't do this because I'm fasting. Everything is fasting. You then exactly you are putting fuel on the fire because next people are saying, you see how these Muslims are unproductive. You see that. They can't work. They can't do no activity. They can't do nothing. So is that not feeding fuel onto the fire? What do you guys reckon? If I say to you, yeah, I can't do any activity because I'm fasting, you're going to naturally conclude from that, fasting ain't beneficial then because your productivity level drops. Are you man following, yeah? So you're putting fuel on the fire. Now, I'm not saying go there like a gladiator and push yourself to, to the end of death. I'm simply saying, if you were to sleep properly, eat properly and do the right stuff, I'm sure you can take it part into normal activities. Alhamdulillah, I work for a living, I do all that as well. And Alhamdulillah, we t our madrasa doesn't shut in Ramadan. I'm a firm believer, Ramadan class should run because that was the month Allah selected for the Qur'an. Why are you not going to teach in Ramadan? It's a falsifier I've got. I never, I never get, nah man, Oy. As much as I can help, I don't give up for Ramadan. There is zero holiday for Ramadan, only with the, because we go around the school holidays. It just so happens that some school holidays coincide. I, well, I don't just say, Chaluji, Ramadan, you don't have chutti. Nah, Ramadan is on. And what we would do is that we would make it a very Qur'an focused Ramadan, really talk about the value of Qur'an, fasting, make it spiritual, so then people can really appreciate and build up more spirituality. Otherwise, the truth is, you're going to just sit at home, right? From four o'clock, those samosas are starting to get out and the, the food is starting to cook. You know, my son Anis, wallahi, he does a ruthless one. He loves watching barbecue videos. <laughs> now listen, no joke, right? I love the customer, right? I was sitting there and he goes, he goes, just watch this, I'm like, what? It was this one Arabic guy, and he, had, he put like a whole shawarma, like a shawaya, a whole barbecue lamb. I'm like, wallahi, why are you doing this, man? He, and he was just watching barbecue, and because we're, I mean, we're foodies, like, we cook barbecue and stuff, rain, snow, sleep, barbecue all the way. So he's, this guy is just roasting this barbecue. It was that soft that he pulled the bone, and the bone came out, and the meat is hanging. And I'm thinking, why are you, sh are we, we can't even eat for another five, six hours, and you're showing me barbecue videos. So obviously that's just torture, but again, he, he finds that, he says no, because then, then you know, you're looking at that, you appreciate what you've got. I'm like, bro, that's gladiator stuff. I'm not a Marine, you get me? Like watching barbecue videos and not get affected. 
So watch what you eat. I mean, watch what you eat, of course, that's you know, before and after. But your activity, keep on doing your normal activity. Otherwise, you are also putting fuel on the fire that, yeah, you man are weak, bruv. Your dean is just tapped because you, you fast and you become so unproductive. It's not, and that's how the logic of the lens people are looking at. Your productivity drops. Rather, it should be that, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a normal thing which I normally do. And prove wrong because Allah knew what was best. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Of course, you are naturally going to have a drop of energy and so on. That's standard. I'm not saying that's not going to happen because ideally the month of Ramadan was for you to take that relaxation to build up that connection with Allah. So I appreciate that it's going to be a challenge. If people can see that despite the challenge, you're adamant on your faith, wallah, this itself is a da'wah. There were some teachers now, they said, look, they're not Muslim, but they said, I swear, I respect my students. You got kids coming, subhanAllah, and I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not encouraging this, yeah? But obviously we teach kids in the madrasa year two, year three, and these, well, one of my kids year three, 30 days rose, how fast? And this was going back like, every year it's the same story. Now it just so happened at the peak fast, one of my students right, was in year two, three, year three, never missed a single fast. And I thought, subhanAllah, look at the will that, and that requires for that. Look at that sort of mental strength and that needs. You don't have to ask the teachers if they're inspired. They must think of that and think, ah, these guys, man, they are, yeah, that's dedication. It, it just so happened, I was listening to a radio show and then there was a discussion and a woman came on and she was speaking about normal life. And yeah, I, I, I wake up this time, I've got to get my kids ready for school. I come back, I do the school run, I do this. I've got my part-time business. And then she said, I'm also fasting on top of that. The presenter said, honestly, hats off to you, mate, because that really shows dedication. I, I, I can't believe how you would do it. And that's the truth. You see, what happens is that people get inspired by this stuff because they think these people take their faith so seriously. They don't mess around. Now, I'm not saying, na'udhi billah, we only practice our faith to impress other people. Of course not. I'm saying when you do the right thing, automatically that will show the beauty of Islam. You get me? Uh, people will see and they say, damn, that's what I'm talking about. These men are on the ball. One of the things to keep yourself a bit at ease right, and comfort is knowing when you do fast in the month of Ramadan, right? Check this out. The Prophet ﷺ mentions, Adam, I want to just translate this hadith quickly. Normal deeds, when you do a normal deed, your deeds are multiplied from 10 to 700. Oh, la la. 10 to how many? 700. So 10 to 700, your deeds are multiplied. Fasting is not like that. Allah mentions in the Hadith Qudsi, إِلَّا صَوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ Fasting is not like that, where it's only 10 to 700. If you do a normal deed, bro, how many? 10 to 700, multiplied. Normal. However, fasting ain't like that. It's not 10 to 700. It's 10 to however much Allah wants to give you and thinks you deserve. And the reason in the Hadith mentioned, يَدَعُ شَحْوَتَهُ وَطَعَامَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِي You know why? It's no, there's no cap, there's no limit, there's no bar. It's because this person's giving up those things which are for my sake, food and things related to their desires. You get me? Giving up these things that which are necessary for human beings existence. Giving up for my sake. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned there's no cap. Now let's be realistic here. Brother here, mashallah, very slim, handsome brother. You're looking two and a half thousand calories to keep him surviving. On the other hand, you've got someone like myself, you might need 3,800, 4,000. If anyone says five, bro, it's dramas, yeah? <laughs> Listen, bro, Molvi, yeah, but I'm gonna go road mode. That's like for the 3,800, but there is gonna be a, a difference, right or wrong? How the heck can it be, right? And, and I'm a profuse, stuck for the Allah forgive me, I drink coffee a lot, okay? Unfortunately, I love my ground beans, I'm on the coffees. Well, the point is, is this now, me, I need more energy to max, you know, to a kind of have a, a good level of energy, whereas the brother might be able to go that slight bit less. How can our ajr be the same when our difficulty, there's gonna be a difficulty, he's gonna have, find it perhaps easier, I might find it more difficult. It might be the other way around. Let's just say the brother, mashallah, is super active in his job. I've got an office job. And I have got an, an office job. My job isn't physical, my job is more mental. The point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can see each and every one of you how much mujahada you're making and accordingly give you the ajr. That's why I say, listen, if you're going through difficulty, if it just so happens that you've got a tough job and it's hard for you, you think Allah's not aware of that. Yes, you'll get the base reward, everyone gets the same. For fasting you get, but one, for your mushaqqa, for your difficulty, for the challenge that you have to go through, that reward subhanallah will be immense. 
That's why you haven't got to think to yourself that, oh, man, fasting is hard. Bro, of course it's hard. It's not easy. But according to that mushakka, according to that difficulty, that's where Allah is going to reward you. you know I mean? So when you're going through difficulty, these are things to think about. Now, there was something I wanted to share with you, which I shared before in a couple of bands, but I think it's important to share here too. Because whether we like it or not, us men are so moved and swayed by stats and statistics and science and all these particular things. I come across a book now which was presented to me. We were having this discussion in one gathering where one brother, he's part of a university, he read this and then he gave a little summary. It tempted and prompted me to go and buy this book myself. The khulasa of the summary of the book is this. It's about fasting intermittently. Have you guys heard of intermittent fasting? Well, it's funny because now they refer to this as the diet of the century. And wallahi, all the geezer did was talk about fasting Monday and Thursday. That's it. And his obviously idea is, is that if you to reduce on those days, 600 calories, five or five, 15, 500 for the women, normal days you eat your normal food. He said that because it will, it, will, it, will, it will create such a drop in insulin levels. And he gave some suggestions of what you can eat in between the week as well. Not like you're binging on smosse for the whole week and then you do all the other, all the other. Bro, you're going to end up being fat, bruv. So take it nice and easy. But you eat your normal food. But the two days, mashallah, you do your fast. He said, guaranteed. And this was not just some... And he claimed, the geezer backed it out with stats. He had a case study. He got people to fast. And one interesting thing was he got two groups of people. And this is what I found really surprising. One group of people, one group of people. Both were type 2 diabetics. You get me? So what happened was that the first group, they were told to eat 1,700 calories as well as the second. They were told the first group, you're going to eat 600, six times a day. You're going to break up those 1,700 calories into small meals. And next man, you're going to only eat twice a day. Same calories, but only twice a day. It was mad. The second group, they lost more weight. And the reason why, because the first one, they're constantly seeing a spike in the insulin. And even though it's the same calories, that was what was causing the weight gain. Whereas the second group, they had the same calories, but it wasn't the constant spike. And as a result, they lost more weight. So similarly, it's a theory like that. Another thing which maybe, if you understand that, maybe not, let me ask you from another angle, because this is something which a lot of youngsters can relate to. Going to a gym, working out, pushing yourself, your body feels some strain, some strain the next day. Right or wrong? That itself is repair and growth. Like the theory of hormesis, for example. Let's just say someone, what is a vaccine? Let's give that example, I've given it before. What is a vaccine? The vaccine is literally break, giving a little bit of the infection and then your body building up the antibodies to fight that. That's what basically a vaccine is. So you're exposing the body to this toxin so the body can re have these antibodies to fight the virus. That's basically what a vaccine is. So you're exposing your body to a little bit of difficulty. The fasting is based on the theory of hormesis that you put your body through a bit of difficulty and it regenerates, rejuvenates, re-kicks in the immune system and makes you more stronger. Now, first I was scratching my head, but subhanAllah, this guy has got stats after stats, case studies, and you just can't deny the research. This is why it caused people to open their eyes and say, bruv, this is what they refer to as the diet of the century. And he's only saying Monday and Thursday. Now, obviously some brothers and sisters might be sitting here and thinking, yeah, but I fasted for years and I just don't see the benefit. You know what the problem is? It's because when we open up our fast, we're smashing kujurs, dates, ruhavza, pakore, we're belting literally like four or five pakori and one dastar khan, bruv. Smose. And that's why you're, you're smashing a thousand calories even before you've had the main meal. In it? How are you supposed to lose weight when you're literally plowing, shoving that many calories? You know, subhanAllah, I was shocked to hear this, but in the, and I'm not saying just the Middle East, there might be other stats, but I just happened to read an article based in the Middle East. The biggest gastric related issues are in Ramadan. That's ironic. You're supposed to calm it in Ramadan. Next man are going there for complications because you've eaten too much. Like literally people flaked out because they've just stuffed so much hubs and bread and rice and meats. Ajib, subhanAllah. I did a dawah of a family member, close family member. We don't eat really bagore. It's just something which I just don't agree with. It just, I'm not acting pious. Oh, I'm so pious, bro. We just eat bagore. I don't like them. They're just too oily. You get me? They're just too oily. So what happened is that we, a family member, he goes, Ya astaghfirullah, where's the pagore, man? Like, astaghfirullah. Like, what are we making a astaghfar for? Like, because it's so abnormal to sit on a Pakistani dastarkhan without a pakora. It's like, that's the thing that goes mandatory with the date. Like, imagine you go home to Sri Lankan, bro, no kanji. 
Like, what the heck is this? Stop for Let me pray two rakat salat tawbah. You know, there's some key things. A lot of the Bengali bro, they have a thing called kiswari. Like kichiri, like, it's a similar, like, very runny rice dal, similar to kanji. Point is, it's some traditional food. Bakora is a killer. You just fasted the whole day, and now you're chucking in all that help, you know, that dense oil, and subhanAllah. That's why we don't see the benefits over even the 30 days of fast. Because our diets go bonkers in Ramadan. Heartburn, burping, literally, subhanAllah, you pray to Raweeh. Allahu Akbar, and you just smell madness going on. In it, astaghfirullah. Am I, am I lying? It's the truth, isn't it? I mean, one person, he, he made this tweet, he goes, he said, Uqsim Billah, if I hear another burp after the Taraweeh, wallahi, there's going to be a janazah. <laughs> like, he got fed up. He goes, that's it. It's just bonkers, man. May Allah forgive us. So anyway, because I want to give you some things, because the reality of us, right, we are, whether we like, we like it or not, we've become a part of this, we, we, we've caught ourselves in this situation where we like to hear stats in relation to science and how it backs up Islam. Then I feel content, oh, Alhamdulillah, Islam's a wonderful religion. Science even proves it. So, okay, because of that inferiority complex, I'm going to chuck some of this stuff in it. I mentioned about the 5-2 fast. Now, reality, Muslim did not big up this fast as much until we did not go viral via TV and Twitter. Reality. When it went viral on TV and Twitter, Muslims really were so proud to talk about Muslims fast five too. It's part of Islam. Because the geezer that came up with the idea, he came on national telly and he said it. Oh, Muhammad used to do this fast. Oi, oi, Muslims went crazy. It was like, Allahu Akbar, Islam is haqqa, so Allahu Akbar. Like, so let me, okay, hold on a second. Park that thought. It took, let's, be, let's say it as it is. It took a white guy to come on TV to tell you your religion is really nice. And for me to now finally say thank you, it really is. Whereas ulama was screaming for the member for 1,444 years. Fell on deaf ears. But the moment someone told us, oh, you know, your religion makes sense. We accepted it. It's called blatantly inferiority complex. We, we just wait for everything. But he went a step further. He even said even more effective than this is AFD fasting. One is, one is intimate and one is AFD fasting. What is AFD? And he mentioned this produces the biggest results. He goes, but it's impractical because of how difficult it is. What is that AFD fast? Eat one day, fast one day. Eat one day, fast one day. He said, this is without a doubt the best fast. Sahih Bukhari hadith. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? The most beloved fast, the best fast, is the fast of Dawood alayhi salam. What did he do? How did he fast? Fast one day, eat one day. Fast one day, eat one day. Muslims never rolled up their sleeves then and said, Allahu Akbar, Islam is the haq. Gorayana, ofir Islam akoya. Wallahi, that's the truth. We can't paint it any of it. That is the reality. Next man to, oh, here, oh, alhamdulillah. Why now? Can you, I'm just trying to say, break that mindset. I don't need you to prove to me my faith. Because I believe in, alhamdulillah, whatever Allah has prescribed upon me. It's called an inferior... Now, look, the reality is this, is that because of... It's a post-colonial slave mentality. That's basically what it is. But I'm not giving a, a politics lesson here. Let's stick on the subject. But the point is, is that there are scientific benefits. But I don't need to be told the science too fast. The only reason why I'm sharing this with you is because the reality is... When you're hungry and you're thirsty, your natural need, human needs kick in. And then you think, oh, fasting stuff. I mean, like, bravo. Like, why? Like, one guy goes, yeah, but why 30 days, man? Like, bro, come on, man. This, what's this, bruv? Well, don't ask me. Ask Allah. What are you asking me for? What are you, like, you're pointing the finger at me. Well, why? How do I know? Ask Allah why 30 days. Why not one week? There's got to be a hikmah behind it, right? But this is the thing. Now, a, a study comes out. Muslim, and do you know what? The geezer, even in his book, said, one of the most radical fasts, but it's literally like a reset for the body, is the Muslim fast. Oh, really? Oh. Like now, again, now, now you're happy again. Wallahi, you just spell slave, bruv. That's it. That's all it does. Na'udhu billah. Allah save us. There are some benefits I want to share with you. Again, this is more of a, more of a science-based thing, yeah? One of the things, that, as I mentioned, that is established from uh, research, fasting kicks in repair genes. Now, this is interesting. As that thing, you know, when your body's going through difficulty, the muscle it kicks in to repair itself, the similar sort of thing when you fast, because you need to keep your energy like, levels replenished. When in the absence of energy, the body's got to fight to find the resources to keep itself alive. 
So you, it regenerate, regenerates, repairs genes in the body, subhanAllah. But there's something which is interesting, right? That you have something called the insulin growth level factor one. This is a hormone that is created in the body. When you're young, you need it to be able to, it's like a growth repair. It helps you grow. But the problem is, when you start getting sort of like midlife age like me, right? It's not healthy to have too much of this hormone. Too much of that, because I'm not growing anymore. I got to about the age of 19, 20 and I stopped. So I was same height as I was back then. Not much difference. Too much of it, that's what gives rise to cancer. And that's why one of the benefits is that by fasting, it can stop the growth of this hormone that creates cancer. Insulin growth level, in fact, one, one thing. Another thing is that there's a hormone which gets secreted in the brain, right? And it's an increase in a protein. When you actually fast, it creates BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The benefit of this is that it stimulates stem cells into nerve cells. It's good for the brain. It, sl it slows down the for you to progress towards dementia. Now again, I don't need that to be told to me. I'm just simply saying to you, my brother, my sister, when you're struggling a little bit, understand Allah didn't tell you any hukum that didn't make sense. Trust me. If you stick according to the sunnah, wallah, you will receive so much benefit. The Prophet says I'm open fast with dates. And he mentioned, if people can't afford dates, this is the hadith, he was giving targhib and encouraging the sahaba, feed people if you can. If you can't feed, give them milk, lassi, like yogurt, give them some dates. So we know that this has been encouraged within the hadith, open your fast in the same way, drink a lot of water, have some milk, have some dates. Again, one date goes in, what's the second thing that goes in? Oy, I heard the word pakora, bismillah. <laughs> You're on the right track, bruv. Exactly that. You know what I'm saying? If we stick according to the sunnah, you'll see that there's benefit. But again, I said, healthier for the brain. Now, someone can say to me at this point, I don't feel healthy, man. I get a headache every time I fast. Who gets headaches? I do. But do you know why that is? What does your body burn mostly for fuel? Carbs, Carbs glucose in the purest form. But one of the jobs of the insulin, of insulin, sorry, your pancreas, is to create insulin and glucagon, right? So it, it, it regulates the amount of sugar in your body. So Allah has created the human body with an optimum level to, let's just say this for argument's sake, to have like a, a level. So if there's too much sugar, insulin breaks the sugar, excess sugar down, gets stored in the liver. And then when your sugars drop, the insulin secretes a, a, a something to break that sugar down back into glucose again. So you always have these optimum levels. But what happens when you're running low and there is no other energy source like sugar or glucose within the body? It needs to go to a secondary source and that is when it goes toward ketones and fats. Now the shift that your brain has to make from glucose to fat, that's what causes the headache. That's what causes you to have a heavy head. That's what causes you to have this sort of lethargic sort of thing in the first three days because your body goes through a shock system. Do you get it? But wallahi, that's not a sign of harm. That's a sign that your fast is working. You get it? And I'll give you another one, subhanAllah. One person mentioned, billah, but I'm sharing this with you because these are the stuff we hear. There's a hadith, that same hadith I mentioned where Allah said, I'm gonna give you 10 to a because you fast for me, you give up my, your desires and so on. In that same hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned further, لِلصَّائِمِ فَرْحَدًا فَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ فِطْرِ وَفَرْحَةٌ عِنْدَ لِقَاءِ رَبِّهِ there's, there's two moments of happiness for everyone who fasts. Number one, iftari time. At that time you feel, oh, alhamdulillah, school na you go away. <laughs> feel so peaceful. And the other one is when you meet Allah on Yawm al qiyamah you'll see the ajr for fasting, you'll say, ya, I should have fasted more. It mentions, in Jannah, Allah created a specific door. The name of the door, Ar-Rayyan, yadkhulu minhu as yawm al qiyamah Those who used to perpetually fast or fast often in the dunya, Allah would say, enter, go through this door. Go through that door and enter into Jannah. Again, faida and benefit. But in the same hadith, it mentions at the ending, and I want to share that part. Wala khalufu sa'im, atyabu indallahi min rih al misk. I'm going to translate this word for word. The, sm the foul smell that comes out of the mouth of the fasting person is more beloved to Allah than musk. Don't worry, you're not going to lose your iman. Some of you think, bro, that sounds a bit cringy. Someone actually said to me, youngster, he goes, so what, bro? Allah likes bad breath, bro. But no, doesn't mean that. That's where you're misunderstanding the hadith. But because someone shared that, I thought, I wonder how many youngsters must think this, but they're afraid to ask their parents because someone's parent was like, what? And they'll do bestie. So, okay, I'll share with you. Don't worry, Mulvi Sahib will share. Okay, it's like this. 
when you fast and you're burning fat in your body, first of all, when you're burning glucose, you don't smell, there's not a foul smell that comes out of the mouth. That's just a normal thing. I mean, look, Allah ma'afirma, you've got two types of people, and I have to clarify, some people whose oral hygiene is just butters. <laughs> you know, they don't floss and their teeth is just brock. I'm not talking about those people. I'm saying if you've got generally good hygiene, when you're burning glucose, the smell is generally the same. When you start to burn ketones, you have like a foul smell. Coming. It's more like a nastier smell, you get me? It doesn't smell right. Someone said it smells like, rot, like strawberry. I, I, I don't know what strawberry you're talking about, brother. It just might be some fungi strawberry. Some shelf life expired strawberry maybe, but not normal good smelling strawberry. But anyway, that's what someone said. Anyway, so that smell coming out of your mouth is a sign that you're burning ketones in the body. When do you burn ketones is when your body ha is having to kick into survival mode because it's looking for energy. Are you guys following, yeah? So it's not that Allah likes the bad smell, but it's the result of your mushakka and your difficulty for the sake of doing that fast, for the sake of Allah, that is creating that smell. That's why Allah likes the smell, because you're doing it for the sake of Allah. That smell is a result of putting yourself through difficulty for Allah's sake. That's why Allah likes the smell. Na'udhu billah, it's not that Allah likes bad fragrance. It mentions in the hadith, you know, if you eat in strong garlic and stuff, you shouldn't even go to the musalla. Where people are praying, you shouldn't go. Why? Because when you let off a burp, it's going to be stinking there, bruv. Or some people smoke and go to the... This is, first of all, smoking, not even jays. And then you're going there and just... Oh, subhanAllah, reminds me of another one. Wallahi, I was in Jum'ah today, man. Allah, Wallahi, I was, I was going to say to the brother, bro, look. We were praying in the musalla in the second room. So there was like... It, the stuff is like this, and then it's like a bit of a curve. You get me? So... There's a normal stuff, and then there must have been this much space. Because now the wall's curved. Do you get what I'm saying, yeah? And your end like this. So now some guy sees a little bit of space, squeezes in. Praise Salah. When he wants to now go into sajda, he's taking back a step. Wallah, those feet stunk, bruv. Wallahi. Allah di qasme, right? I felt so angry. Wallahi. The geezer had white socks on. May Allah forgive me, Allah di I, I was literally biting my tongue the whole time thinking, do I say something to this brother? I don't know, if I knew him, I would have said, bro, I love you for the sake of Allah, but those socks are buzz. <laughs> but I didn't know who this guy was. And you know, people can take offense. People can take, because they don't know me. And I'm not going to go say, brother, you know the socks, you know? I'm going to say, bro, they stink, bro. They stink. So it's like, Allah forbid. Anyway, let me know, tell you another story. But uh, what do you say to the person like that? And, and you're taking a step back. Bro, use your aql. There's no space in the, musal, the stuff. Go back. But no, I'm going to deliberately step. And I'm praying there. Well, and his foot is here. I, I can just smell athlete's foot or something. It was just knocking me out. Na'udhu billah. Sorry to give you the grim definition, right? And the example. I just felt so... And you, now, you understand the hadith now. Bad smell pushes away the malaika. The malaika don't like this. Now, I appreciate some people have to go work. Cool. Bro, you could have just taken those socks off, in it. How hard was it to take off those socks? It's all about using your damag, which Allah jana some people don't have. Anyway, so I've given the example of insulin growth neurofactor, ketones, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, regeneration, rejuvenation of stem cells, another benefit of fasting, increasing longevity, increasing life. Now, obviously, don't get me wrong, I, I mean, it's questionable, but I'll just share with you. They did like a study on mice, which are Muslim mice, as usual. And they noticed that these mice are just living for some long age. And they realized, what they did was they put them under similar fasting-like conditions, calorie-controlled diets, and, and, and them sort of like intermittent fasting. And it increased the longevity of even humble little creatures like mice, you get me? So human beings, inshallah, it'll be a source of benefit. Anyway, like I said, I'm not here to give you a science lesson, but really rather to focus on an Islamic side of things. All I sh the reason why I shared that with you is when things are getting tough and you've got the headache and you're feeling quite under it, it's good to know these things because then you can rely on that as well. And understand Allah has not given you no command that doesn't make sense. Everything makes logical sense and it will have its benefits, inshallah. In conclusion, I want to mention one more thing. And that is this, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in this particular month, the doors of Jannah are opened. The doors of the fire are closed and shayateen are locked up. People generally ask a question and you may know the answer to this, alhamdulillah. That despite, according to the hadith, if shayateen are locked up, 
why do we still see problems happening within the dunya? The answer for that is two. The muhaddithun and the scholars of hadith have given two answers. Number one, not all shayateen are locked up, but those ones which are ultimate rebellious, hardcore, maradatul shayateen, the next level mad ones. That's one opinion. But the other one, right, is it's not even opinion, it's like this. Two things cause you to sin. One is shayateen and, and shaitan, and the shaitan you have with you. So it's not this just one big shaitan that comes around everyone and puts a waswasa. He's got armies of shayateen working under him. So the shaitan that's with you might not be the iblis, it will be a shaitan that works for shaitan. You get it? You still have your nafs, in it? You still have your nafs? And your nafs is more khatarnaak and dangerous than shaitan. What created shaitan? Nafs, ego, desire, that, that created shaitan, you know what I'm saying? So we have this nafs, we have these desires. By fasting, you control it. It can be controlled. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, well, actually let me not mention that hadith because I will open up another chapter. But it, keeping on about, talking about taqwa, that is why one of the reasons why the ultimate benefit of fast is taqwa. Because with the absence of shayateen, absence of shayateen to ruin your fast, You've got to contend against your nafs. Now the nafs obviously is challenging to deal with, but it takes a bit of practice. It takes a bit of practice. And if you can engage yourself in good deeds, slowly, 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 slowly throughout the month, you can slowly, not to control it completely, but it will inshallah get better. So my humble advice is this, how do we increase good deeds? In a couple of minutes, I'll finish off. And that is try to make a timetable for yourselves. Try to make a timetable, and, you, a, and a realistic one. Don't say inshallah, I'm gonna read 15 spots of the day, two hours of this, bro. Take it, inshallah, I, I salute your enthusiasm, but try to be realistic and just try to, at intervals, fit in and break it out over the day. Similarly as well, make a plan for yourself. Alhamdulillah, what I generally do is have a schedule and, and I try to stick to that. And I can only offer you that as a suggestion, not to try and show you how buzruk I am and, you know, make it up, once you buy, not that stuff, na'udhu billah. But to just simply say that as a human, I need that as well. I have to have the routine, six o'clock this, seven o'clock this, eight o'clock this, I'm doing this before Ramadan, I'm, uh, before iftar, this before this. So get yourself in that routine, inshallah. And that's, the, that's my humble advice. Try not to waste too much time. Wallah, I find it really upsetting that in Ramadan, is a time when people binge and watch TV and stuff. Like they, they, they call it, all right, some programs of an Islamic nature can be quite beneficial. I'm not knocking that. But they have these Ramadan transmissions. A lot of the time, is, a lot of it is fazul. You can use that time worshipping Allah, obeying Allah, reading Quran, improving that connection with Allah. You'd get more on a, on a level than listening to some transmission. I'm not saying the transmission's halal, I mean haram, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm simply saying you can use your time in more of an effective way. Before we go, we make dua that Allah wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to make amal and practice on whatever good has been said and enable us inshallah that after Ramadan we gather again bi ta'ala.